<laughs> Welcome everyone to the May general meeting of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society, and I want to welcome you a happy Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> During the break, margaritas. So, yeah. you ready? Uh, so it is great to have you all here live and in person at the Kalamazoo Area Math and Science Center, and I do want to welcome the uh, visitors on uh, Zoom at home. But I, I just want to keep restressing that for, for live guest speakers here at Kansi, like we have tonight, it is really important to have a, a good sized crowd here at Kansi uh, so we can continue to uh, get high quality guest speakers like we have here tonight and uh, keep doing this on Zoom because uh, we can't have, you know, we've got to have uh, people here to bring people here. And it's either, you know, one or the other. We can't, we can't uh, keep just relying on Zoom for the local folks. We got to, the Zoom is really for the out of state folks or maybe folks that are still a little worried about COVID. But of course, you know, the emergency is over. Everything's fine now. <laughs> so uh, let me jump right into the president's report here because there, there, there are several things to go over. I was surprised. But uh, real quick, uh, we are still looking for a new equipment manager. Um, we did have one volunteer, but it's uh, somebody that's already on the board, and I, I kind of want to find spots for everybody so we can spread stuff around and not have everything rely on one person. So again, the equipment manager uh, basically uh, checks out the uh, club's small collection of uh, telescopes, binoculars, and such, and it's really easy. It demands very little of your time, probably at most. Uh, per month, maybe a couple hours. So it's very low demanding. Maybe the, the touchy part for some people is you might have to keep the equipment at your place, you know, for prolonged periods of time. But even if that's a problem, we can always uh, put the uh, stuff for loan in storage and we can give you the key to storage. So you can grab stuff from there and bring it to a meeting or have members meet you at storage to give them the equipment. So Again, it demands very, very little of your time. And we do need a volunteer to uh, take over for Arya, who's been doing it for nearly 10 years. And again, I would prefer it be, you know, it had to be a, a member that regularly attends meetings um, and also is fairly active amateur astronomer. You know, so you at least have the basics of equipment down so you can show people how to set stuff up. All of our stuff is very easy uh, to use with maybe the exception of the camera that we have, but that's in my custody. I'm, I'm not giving it up. <laughs> um, and we are also still looking for uh, new library telescope coordinators. Uh, if you don't know, you know, we have uh, two telescopes, the two tabletop telescopes from Orion um, at the Portage District Library. Used to be three, but someone had sticky fingers and now it's two. <laughs> And uh, we also have one at the Kansas Public Library. And uh, there used to be three people on the library kind of telescope committee or program, uh, but they either left the club due to illness or just left the area and uh, they're not in the club anymore. Uh, so Mike Cook has been doing this all by himself uh, for several years now, at least four or five years. And, uh, you know, he has a pretty hectic schedule. And we, we did recently get one volunteer to help him. And I tried to tell Mike about it, but again, he doesn't respond to email, at least to me very often. <laughs> I don't know if I should take that personally, but uh, hopefully uh, Mike will uh, get the new volunteer going. So if you do volunteer, you will not be alone. There's at least two people in it already. And uh, so again, that requires very little uh, time, uh, especially if we just maintain what we have now, just maintain the telescopes a couple times a year if, if, at most. but. If you do want to get more active, uh, we would like the program to spread to other libraries. You know, they, they started this program in New Hampshire and it spread all over the entire state. Of course, their state's a lot smaller, so yeah. it's a little easier for them. And I just wanted to give a quick update on our Eclipse series. As mentioned, we're going to have a whole series of presentations and workshops uh, building up to the 2024 Eclipse between November uh, of this year and March of next year, because April, we ain't doing anything. We're, we're, some of us are hitting the road, so no meetings or probably even observing in April of next year. And I, I did finish the grant. Uh, that's between the 
this month, this month's newsletter and the grant. That's pretty much my April. So um, I've been spending the past uh, week getting caught up. So if you email me or maybe call me, which you should hardly ever do, I prefer email. I, I'm slowly, I should be mostly caught up on replying to people that have contacted me because it's been a lot uh, that I, that I kind of let build up. But uh, I, I should be caught up. And uh, I, of course, I don't know the uh, status of the grant. It's a little early for that. I didn't drop it off till I think the 26th. But uh, if it works out, we're going to have some fantastic programming, you know, lots of uh, great quality speakers. Some of the most of them, I think, or if not all, uh, saw the recent eclipse down in um, Australia, at least that, that region of the world. And we'll talk more about that later. And I just want to thank uh, Karen Woodworth. Um, I did ask uh, uh, Molly Williams, because she's usually been my go-to person to review the grant, but uh, we're, we're happy to say that, you know, Roger Williams was in the hospital, but now he's not. That's the happy part, not the, being in the hospital part. Uh, but now he's fine. And, uh, but of course, you know, uh, I had a deadline for the grant and uh, I asked Karen to look it over and she made very, uh, several very good recommendations and the grant is, I think, pretty solid. We haven't been turned down yet, so we'll, so we'll see how it goes. Um, one thing we'll figure out at the board meeting this Sunday is a date for our next OWL Observatory maintenance session. Uh, we did check out the observatory during the first public session in April, which we probably should have canceled, but we didn't. But we did get to see Venus, so that, that was something. Um, <laughs> that's about it. But the observatory definitely needs some repairs. There's uh, some wood that needs to be replaced that's rotted, which happens has happened many times over the years. Um, we need to uh, basically re restain the entire building, and we need to uh, thoroughly clean the interior because it's a uh, cobweb and dead bug city uh, inside right now. Although it's not as bad as it was a couple of years ago when I first walked in for the public observing session. I was like, how come there's raisins all over the floor? <laughs> well, it was, it was dead bugs. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, if you think you want to volunteer to help clean the observatory, as usual, uh, drop me an email, but I'll, I'll probably send out an email to the membership anyway as soon as we get a date settled uh, this Sunday at the board meeting. And speaking of the observatory, if you're interested in using the Leonard James Ashby Telescope, which of course is a 16-inch telescope on an astrophysics mount, and uh, along with NONA, which is our Teleview 101, um, just let me know. You could take the training session. I, I prefer at least two to four people to, to do a training session. <laughs> Um, I, I, I don't want a dozen because the observatory is very small, uh, so we don't have room for a dozen in there. So really all, all we need is two to four people that say they want to take a training session, or if you took a training session, you can kind of refresh yourself because we have a fantastic telescope out there, much better than before, very stable, much bigger, great uh, set of eyepieces and filters, so the place is extremely well equip equipped. Uh, for members to use. Unlike the remote telescope, there's no additional fee, but we'll, we might bother you for donations from time to time. And if you do clean and you use the observatory, uh, we'll kind of stress that you should probably be there to help clean the place if you use the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, next up, um, we uh, We'll talk about this again at the board meeting coming Sunday, but uh, we do have one outreach opportunity coming up next month. Is we have been invited to participate in Space Steam Day at the Air Zoo. Um, they'll have three of these, but the first one is on space, and uh, that's going to be on June 24th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Again, that's at the Air Zoo. And we can at least offer solar viewing. We can, we can set up telescopes with white light and H alpha filters. Uh, we can even um, do a hands on activity or two. We can probably at least set up our table uh, to pass out literature like we have out there. We can show our eclipse poster, um, you know, do, do stuff like that. So, again, we need volunteers to set up uh, at least telescopes. But if you, if you don't have a telescope and want to at least uh, maybe run a hands on activity or um, pass out brochures, let me know. But again, we'll, we'll hound people for uh, volunteers. Um, it, it's been difficult getting people to volunteer since the pandemic. And uh, that's uh, one of the reasons why I do miss Astronomy Day a little bit. There's, there's, a, lot, there's a lot about it I don't miss. 
but, but the one thing that I do miss is we usually had 30 to 40 members that volunteered and we haven't been able to really do stuff like that since then. So we need to kind of get people back in the swing of things to volunteer for stuff like this. And that's it's what keeps the club alive. And uh, just one quick thing I want to throw out there is if um, there's any activities you would like us to do, like over the spring or summer, let us know. We could do astrophotography workshops, which would be, we could do like a solar workshop, because we do have a really nice H output filter in the observatory that goes on the uh, Teleview, you know, donuts. Uh, so, so we could do solar imaging, we could do both, you know, H alpha and white light, because we've got a, a white light filter for at least the 16 inch. We don't have one for the tele yet, but maybe we can get one. Uh, we could do moon, a, a moon workshop, just go out and take pictures of the moon. If for some reason you want to, some people like the moon, like Joe, but he's insane, so don't. Uh, and of course, we can do deep sky stuff too. We have a nice ZWO camera out there. So we could uh, show you how to look it all up for deep sky astrophotography and uh, do that. So, you know, there's no equipment to set up really except for the camera. So, you know, it's very easy to use the observatory now, much easier than it has been. It's all basically button pushing now. There's no more big stick to roll off a heavy roof. You just hit a button, roof, roof, roof goes off. And um, I did get a, 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 a Email from the student recently. I forgot to get on the internet here, so let me see if I can do that real quick. Because I was going to read the email, but uh, I forgot to get on. But let me do that. Apologies about that. Yes, I guess. I accept your terms. So anyway, um, let me try to give you the thumbnail while we're working here. It is apparently um, the Kalamazoo City Commission, there we go, is going to redo the lighting, which they have been working on. So here, there it is. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll read the first three lines and then pause for laughter, because I, I know Mike's going to laugh for sure. Because, uh, uh, spoiler, this is one of my past students, so she, she starts out, Hello, Professor Bell. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't, I, that, you laughed too loud. You to get it. <laughs> so, of course, I corrected her about that. I never, even in class, I told them to call me Richard. So, um, so uh, I am contacting you regarding the proposed uh, zoning update by the Kalamazoo City Planning Commission. Including changes for outdoor lighting, specifically disallowing the high-low pressure sodium lamps while allowing blue spectrum heavy LED lighting. And th there is language about uh, shields and uh, shielding outdoor lighting and, and the code, that the code would allow uh, projecting signs like LED billboards without a special use permit. So basically, um, if you have the time, maybe write up a short letter uh, to the Kalamazoo uh, City Planning Commission, maybe Mark, for example, could tell us exactly how to do that. And uh, just tell them, you know, we don't want the bright blue LED lighting, like the, you know, five, 6,000 Kelvin. What we really want is maybe the 2,500 Kelvin or 3,000 Kelvin uh, LED lighting, because that gives the more yellowish sodium vapor type glow. And uh, I, I just learned, you know, uh, just last year, they installed the bright blue LED lighting in my neighborhood. And I just realized over the winter when there's snow on the ground, and that's glary as hell. Uh, it's just awful when you have snow on the ground with that bright white blue lighting. So um, if you care about the night sky, uh, it might not hurt to you know maybe go to a meeting, or write, write them a letter, send them an email, um, stuff like that. So that, that stuff is pretty horrible. Okay. And um, I just wanted to uh, do a quick feel out there. Um, some of you know that during the pandemic, I um, not only did I do the five-part lecture series, which of course was very, very popular. That's why we have so many out-of-state people now. But uh, at least a few times, I did my uh, introduction to astronomy class. Yeah, um, so it's basically an 11-week course with 22 lectures. It, it's a full-blown uh, college-level course that I actually used to teach. But this time we do it all on Zoom. Uh, there's no grades. I don't take attendance, you know, so there's no pressure. 
Um, a lot of students that took my class like that never even showed up on Zoom. They just watched the YouTube recording. So if you have a really busy schedule, don't let that stop you. You can always just watch them later on YouTube. You know, there are tests that you can take, you know, on your own and grade yourself, but you don't have to tell anyone your grade. I never see them. Um, and there's little assignments to do during the lecture and stuff like that. So if you're looking to learn the basics of astronomy, don't want to pay five, six hundred dollars for tuition at, say, KVCC or Western or Definitely don't want to take it from Sinclair. He's mean, so don't know. <laughs> <what that is. laughs> uh, uh, so um, I'm just, I just thought I'd throw that out. We probably wouldn't start till uh, sometime in late September and, uh, and do that. So if, if you're interested, just let me know. And uh, real quick here, I'm just curious. We, we've talked a lot about the April 8, 2024 eclipse, but how many people have plans for the October 14, 2023 annual eclipse? Anybody going anywhere? Nobody? Everyone's just going to stay here and see it as partial, if, if, if at all? Well, uh, I mentioned that I'm going to Roswell, New Mexico. I've always wanted to go there. I want to see where the aliens landed. I'm going to see the Robert Goddard. Oh, yeah, that's really nice. Land, so I want to see that. Right so I want to do the fake stuff and I want to do the real stuff. So just uh, if anyone's curious, that, that, I, I want to go there, but it depends. All right. So let's uh, let's get going here. I know that went a little longer than usual, but again, there's a lot going on and uh, we want to get going for the summer. All right. So tonight's guest speaker is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Notre Dame, where he studies the formation of the Milky Way and dwarf galaxies using high resolution hydrodynamic simulations. He received his bachelor's degree in physics at Waseda University, and, uh, which is in Japan. And then he moved to the University of Tokyo as a graduate student where he earned a master's degree in 2015 and a PhD in astronomy in 2018. He worked as a postdoctoral researcher at Riken and Tohoku uh, University before joining the University of Notre Dame in December 2021. So I should have read this in more detail instead of asking you earlier. Uh, so he has numerous experiences uh, uh, talking about galaxy formation and the origin of elements and taught physics at Conan University. And he has awarded, uh, he has been awarded the Springer thesis, the, the uh, Riken Special uh, Postdoctoral Researcher and the JSPS Research Fellowship. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Itaka Hira. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your introduction. So today I'm going to talk about the history of the Milky Way. So let's share the screen. Yeah. Perfect. Those are online. Can you find? Can you do it here? Maybe okay. Yeah, don't worry. They'll they'll tell us at home if they can hear us. Um, okay. okay. So let's begin the presentation. So thank you very much for your introduction. I'm Yudaka Hirai. And thank you very much for your invitations. I'm very honored to be here. So I am a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Notre Dame. So today we're gonna go to the history of the Milky Way. So this picture is taken from the Lake Michigan. And from the ancient era, um, we see a Milky Way and we think about how it forms. So if I ask the question, have we ever seen the Milky Way? I suppose um, all of you have seen in this group. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah, but if I ask in Tokyo, maybe about this and how people say yes. <laughs> but yeah, actually the Milky Way is a kind of, uh, it looks like a cloud. And then, you know, uh, it's, actually we now know that this 
well, this object is made of a lot of stars. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you how uh, the understanding of the Milky Way has been uh, evolved by uh, our efforts. So nowadays, astronomers try to understand the Milky Way by using large telescope. This is a VLT uh, uh, operated by Europe and some uh, simulations I will talk about today. And this picture actually, you know, the more detailed uh, map of the Milky Way taken by the astrometry satellite Gaia. So as you can see, um, there is a large um, brightest region, which is called Bulge, at the center of the Milky Way. And out here, there is the you know, horizontal component. This is called disk. Actually, we live in the disk of the Milky Way around here. And also, it is difficult to see, but there is a diffuse, very diffuse component of the stars. These components are called halo. Because it's so diffuse, and so it's very see uh, from this picture, but studying the halo is also very important because it has a lot of uh, old stars, which was born in the very ancient era of the Milky Way. So like this about this halo. And Milky Way also has several satellites which is dwarf galaxies. Well, as you can see, there is a large Magellanic cloud, small Magellanic cloud, and several dwarf galaxies. Well, we can go see it from the picture. And this galaxy is also very important because I, as I will talk, this dwarf galaxy will be a kind of remnant of the building blocks of the Milky Way. Also, there are several bright uh, dots here. These are called globular clusters. These are also, the, well, the formation of itself is very uh, unknown, actually, but it's very important that it also has a lot of old stars. So this is a kind of, you know, the pitch of the Milky Way. So let's go to the journey of the Milky Way by using a simulation. This movie are uh, created by the hydrodynamic simulations of the Milky Way, and it says that, uh, well, the journey is the Milky Way. Now, we are uh, the place where the sun is uh, located. So each dot uh, represents the stars. And the black clouds are the gas clouds that form stars. And then going to the center of the Milky Way, and as you can see, a lot of stars are here. And then move going upward. Then you can see the face on image of the Milky Way. So actually, the Milky Way is a disk galaxy with a spiral. And there, are, as you can see, there are a lot of uh, gas from this region, which is a star forming region. And we see the nuclear. And as you can see, in the Milky Way, stars are formed as a star clusters like this, from the gas clouds. And then these, these star clusters are dispersed as a time pass around the Milky Way. So then these are then going around the Milky Way through so the history of the stars. And as you can see, the Milky Way has a kind of bar-like structures at the center. So this galaxy is a kind of the so-called bar galaxies. So from the bottom, and um, then we move to the upward, to the Milky Way, to the disk. So the Milky Way is actually based on image is like a spiral galaxy, but we live inside the Milky Way. So if we look at the Milky Way from the sun, so as you can see, the Milky Way is like the disk like structure. And then you know, there is like, you know, about um, the sun, that's plane which forms stars. So this is a kind of, you know, um, journey of the Milky Way using the hydrodynamic situations. So before going detail of the simulations, let's go to the history of the study of history. So how we know 
the Milky Way, Big Java Milky Way. Well, maybe as you know, that in the ancient era, very long, long history, people thought that the Earth is at the center of the universe, which is called geocentric model. So this is, you know, Charlie's uh, book. Uh, and then he, he you know, um, writes the, you know, uh, the text for the geocentric model. And this model, we are the center of the universe, and other planets and the sun uh, go around this our the Earth. And the other stars, actually you know, located in the sphere of the universe on the outside. So this is a kind of global picture of the long-standing of the history of our, our selves. So this model has been reviewed by, you know, I don't know, the Copernicus, uh, Helios and Chiefs. So he studied in detail about the motion of the planets. And he found that, you know, geocentric model is too complicated to explain because, you know, there's some planets like the Mars, and the Jupiters are going sometimes backward before backward. So to explain such kind of things, just model is very difficult. So very complicated model has been proposed. So he tried to simply simplify the you know model, models, and then he came up that the we are not at the center of the universe. Well, actually, the sun is actually um, the center of the universe. This is called heliocentrism. So this heliocentrism has been confirmed by you know, numerous observations uh, throughout the history of our, our studies. So, for example, Guy Garrier is the you know kind of first man to you know watch the st stars by the telescopes. So, as you know, uh, that he uh, write a lot of sketches about the you know the moon, the planets, Saturn, and so on. He also look at the Milky Way. And if he found that the, in the Milky Way, uh, it has, it is not actually a cloud, it has a lot of stars. And he said that the Milky Way is nothing else but a mass of innumerable stars planted together in clusters. So more, you know, realistic picture of the Milky Way has been studied by William Paschal. He developed a very large telescope and then observed each stars in the sky. This sketch is the way of Hashir's uh, Milky Way. Well, it's really like a Milky Way. It's like a DC like structures, and then, you know, propose a lot of stars. The major difference is that the sun is at the center of the Milky Way. So, but yeah, as far as this era, so this kind of understanding is very similar. The Milky Way is, uh, is actually the cluster of stars. So in 1920, there was a very important debate about the understanding of the Milky Way. Chakra actually did a uh, you know, breakthrough in understanding of the Milky Way. He observed the distance of the globular clusters around the Milky Way and found that globular clusters distribution is not homogeneous. Well, he found that the global clusters are concentrated at some point, which is closer to the bulge, and then going, you know, the number decreases. And, you know, so if the sun is at the center of the Milky Way, the global clusters should be con concentrated in the nearby. However, the concentration, the most concentrated region is different. This means that the sun is not at the center of the Milky Way. So this is actually another breakthrough in an understanding of the Milky Way. So we are actually outside from the center of the Milky Way. But he thought, or also thought that all of the objects in the universe has been inside the Milky Way, you know, such as Andromeda galaxies and some, some spiral, uh, well, nebula. These are, you know, he thinks that these objects are also inside the Milky Way. So the Milky Way is a kind of the universe itself. On the other hand, uh, Professor Curtis thought that the Andromeda or some spiral nebula are outside of the Milky Way uh, from his observations. So these two guys are uh, uh, debate um, um, to 1920, and this is called the Great Debate. 
and from all the astronaut Mars. Uh, so whether or not the Milky Way is the universe itself, or Milky Way is just one galaxy in the universe. So this question has been answered by Edwin Kapoor. So he observed a lot of galaxies by using 100 inch uh, Mount Wilson telescopes. What we found, what we did actually was he observed the stars uh, in the Andromeda galaxy, uh, which is variable stars. The variable stars, there is the relation between the variability and the brightness. So we can know the you know, exact brightness of these objects. So they can, he can measure the distance from uh, of the you know, Andromeda galaxy. And we found that Andromeda galaxy is way far from the edge of the Milky Way. So actually, we confirmed that the Milky, uh, Andromeda galaxy is another object similar to the Milky Way. And we also observed a lot of spiral nebula. Now we understand that we understand that these are galaxies. And the finding is that the you know, more distant galaxy has a redder color. This means, if, oh, if you learn the height physics, then you know the Doppler effect. Well, the galaxy in the part of the universe are moving faster from us. So that, you know, the universe is expanding. So, and he, he confirmed that the Milky Way is just one of the uh, galaxies uh, throughout the universe. And then, you know, the universe is also expanding. So this is called Hapu's ball. But from his observations, he also classified the galaxies. So this is the, you know, Hapu's classification of the galaxies. So as he observed a lot of galaxies, so he classified, well, elliptical galaxies and spiral galaxies. So from the elliptical he numbered elliptical galaxies from E0 to E7. And, and spiral galaxies, if they have the spherical bulge, it is called SA to SC. Well, this ABC means the you know, degree of spirals uh, in each galaxy. And if they have a bar-like structure in the center, at the center of the galaxies, they are uh, being you know, classified as SD galaxies. And current understanding of the Milky Way is that the bar-like galaxy are uh, like SDB or SDC. So thanks to the efforts of the observations by Hubble and other astronomers, we now know that the Milky Way is one of the galaxies in the universe. So, and well, not a special, actually. Well, the galaxy, in the galaxy, in, in the entire universe, there are about 200 billion to 2 trillion galaxies in the observable uh, fields. So Milky Way, actually one of them. So let's move on to the, how we study the Milky Way in the modern astrophysics. And one way to study the Milky Way is to observe distant galaxies. So this is a kind of snapshot of the dark galaxies in a different uh, places of the universe. So because, you know, um, the speed of light is limited. So if we observe uh, you know, more distant galaxies, so we can see the past of the universe. So if we find the galaxy similar to the Milky Way, and then going backwards, we can guess how the Milky Way uh, evolved throughout the history of the past. So this is a kind of a direct way to study the Milky Way. However, this kind of study cannot study uh, the detail of each of the galaxies. Well, it's very too far to look at these galaxies in detail. And also, this is, these galaxies are not the Milky Way itself. So the alternative method is called galactic archaeology. In a galactic archaeology, we observe individual stars in the Milky Way or Andromeda galaxy. We use <laughs> chemical abundance and kinematics of these stars. These are actually the fossil records of the, uh, the, the universe because the chemical abundance 
Well, because you know the elements are formed in the stars. So the stars are formed from the gas in the previous uh, generations of star stars. So if we observe the elements in chemical analysis, we can get the information where the stars are formed. Also, stars kinematics, well, some kinematics preserve a long time scale. So if I observe, we observe kinematics of stars, we can get the information where the stars come from. But using such information, we try to understand the Milky Way. This is called galactic archaeology. And these two are kinds of observational method. But these observations only get a snapshot. So we need to connect with these. So this is actually can be done by using a computer simulation, by using supercomputer. So by using, by simulate the Milky Way, uh, using a supercomputer, and then compare with the observations, so we can get information how each stars are formed in the Milky Way. By using these three methods, we, the astronomers are trying to understand the formation of the Milky Way. So let's move on to the classical scenario of the Milky Way arrow formation. So as I introduced, Milky Way composed of three components, bulge, disk, and halo. And we think that halo are formed first, and the disk are formed later because of the age of the stars. But the most famous, you know, um, classical formation scenario was called ELS model, uh, named by Egan Lydenwell Sandage. So these guys, the, the observations of the Milky Way stars, and then find that the old stars has more eccentric orbit. This means that the Milky Way was formed in a very early time scale by the collapse of the gas. So this picture represents the kind of model uh, they propose. So at the time, early time of the universe, there was a kind of, you know, the gas cloud called Prop Galaxy. And these gas are cool and then flaps and form stars. And then after that, the, the you know stars are formed and further. And then if the gas clouds are located, then at the center of the gas are further form a disk like objects by the cool. And then form the Milky Way like structures. So this time scale is about only um, 100 million years. So this is a kind of the ELS model. And then, well, in the 20th century, the ELS model is a kind of, uh, you know, uh, very you know, popular model of the formation scenario of the Milky Way. The alternative scenario has been proposed by Charlotte and Jim. So they observe the chemical abundance mean metallicity of the globular clusters, and they find that they, each globular clusters do not have any difference if we go to the outside of the Milky Way. So this means that the Milky Way's formation is a kind of, you know, well, stochastic. So it's a kind of uh, experience, a lot of mergers uh, throughout the history. So in their model, there are a lot of gas clouds, and then each gas cloud forms star clusters. And then each gas clouds are merged together and then form the Milky Way in the very low time scale, more than 1 billion years. So this is actually the solid and the uh, SZ model. So nowadays, we can get a lot of uh, stars, stellar abundances, and kinematics by the observations. This is the telescope green by the long distance by stars. And by using such a telescopes, we found that the conclusions made by the Egan and Leiden sandwich was based on the biased data uh, because it is difficult to observe fully the sky. So if they observe the uh, full side of the Milky Way, 
there's no correlation between the uh, the theta age and the uh, um, eccentricity. So they, we now prefer the you know uh, the hierarchical uh, structure formation scenario. But it's also uh, this is not that actually you know this model is each protoplanetic clumps are formed like this, but uh, in the long time scale, the Milky Way actually formed by the clustering of the smooth system. Now we have very, very powerful tool, uh, which is the astrometry satellite Gaia. The Gaia actually uh, observed the each position of the stars very accurately. So we can get the, you know, uh, the kind of, you know, how to move the stars very precisely by using Gaia. If by using this telescope, we can get the information of the, each margin event of to the Milky Way. Like this. So we are now here, and if the, you know, low galaxy, as I show, are merged to the Milky Way, this kind of structure, obviously. This is called stream, stream. So, you know, uh, you know, if the dwarf galaxy is going towards the Milky Way, if it's too close, it is disrupted by the gravity of the Milky Way, and then going towards the sky over. And if it's too old, it's, well, this kind of structures can be erased. However, if we look at closely the kinematics moving of the stars, the velocity of the stars, uh, we can get information of the uh, the remnants of the dwarf galaxy mass in the very highest area. So, from the observations, we now know that formation of the Milky Way's halo can be attributed to the clustering of a small system, which is called hierarchical gas structure formation. So, based on this, we tried further try to understand the Milky Way's formation by using simulations. So let's look at the simulation of the galaxy formations and how we simulate the galaxy in supercomputers. So this is our cosmological simulations of the Milky Way formations. Well, this era is very early stages of the galaxy formation. So the materials in the early stage, about maybe 10 billion years ago, materials are, you know, existed around the dark matter pyramids. And there are a lot of dwarf galaxies are formed in the you know, matter concentrated on each halos. And as you will see, each of the small dwarf, uh, small galaxies march together and then grow uh, part of the So let's look at these two galaxies mass together. And then we apply and but then they are traditionally interacting with each other so they can merge together. Like this. So if these galaxies are mass, gas are compressed and new stars are formed. And later, the galaxy margin will be decreasing and continuous accretion of gas materials from the outside will form the disk-like object like this. But this is a kind of, you know, cosmological simulations of the current cosmological simulations of the Milky Way. So how we compute the Milky Way's formation in five band simulations? In the simulation, basically, we saw the, you know, gravitational interactions of the star, each star. Like if you learn high school physics, maybe you can be And if, if, if there are two stars, we compute two uh, gravitational forces between two part of stars. And if you have, we have three stars, we compute each you know, gravitational interactions. And we do for many stars inside simulations, and then compute the gravitational evolutions of the, uh, each galaxy. Also, inside the galaxies, there are cycles of materials. So we can, we should model such of things using hydrodynamics and models of star formation and some explosion of stars. 
to cycle materials in galaxies like this. So when the stars are formed, some stars are evolved, and then at, at the end of their lifetime, they explode as the supernovae or are just you know, in their life. And then when the supernova explodes, uh, these are you know, the gas from the you know, star are distributed to the, you know, um, the Milky Way again, and then the new stars are born. So this cycle is very important because almost all the elements in the universe has been synthesized inside the stars. But these elements actually are produced from the supernova or other you know, events of the stars. And then newly born stars uh, absorb such a material in such a major way. So the galaxy evolution has been known by using by, by cycle of materials. We, in the galaxy formation simulations, we put the models of each star formation and supernovae supernovi, uh, inside the simulations and then compute together with the gravitation of the directions of stars. So this is how we compute the formation of the galaxy. So nowadays, astronomers can compute galaxies very realistic. Uh, it looks like very realistic. So these pictures compare the observed universe and the simulated universe. So, well, I want to do um, a kind of quiz uh, for these pictures. So left side or right side are the simulated universe. Yeah, well, the other one is actually the observed universe. So please raise your hand if you think the left side is the simulated universe. Oh. Yeah, great. Right. So if you think right side is a simulated universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe 64, yeah, great. So yeah, actually it's so difficult to distinguish between these two. So, uh, well, the answer is actually, you know, the right side is similar in the But yeah, as you see, it's almost indistinguishable. Or oh, maybe if you have a good eye, maybe this is the Hubble Space Telescope image. And maybe there is some, something like, uh, well, this is, a, for example, the foreground stars, not the galaxy. But uh, this is a simulation, so it contains all, all of the stars, all the galaxies. So, and uh, yeah, each galaxy is a little bit bigger. But uh, yeah, as you can see, it's almost indistinguishable. So we can create the you know, very similar uh, universe uh, inside the supercomputer. So nowadays, so we can pick up the Milky Way like galaxies from such kind of simulations and then compute very high resolution by supercomputers like this. So in the world, we are now uh, using very realistic simulations of a new way, uh, in a very different project in the cell, uh, well, recently published on the release from the Royal Astronomical Society. So these, by using such simulations and then compare to the observations of the Milky Way, and we can get more you know, uh, precise history of the Milky Way. So this figure, well, summarizes the current understanding of the margin history of the Milky Way. As I said, in the cosmological context, Milky Way experienced a lot of mergers. So now, by using the uh, computer simulations and observations, we identify several margin events previously happened. So the, in the center is the evolution of the Milky Way, that's the us, and then each uh, dot shows the mass of gas. And then, well, we name as a kind of, you know, our oh, list you can see here, yeah. the Gaia and Kyrgyz or something like that. And then, um, Sequonia, yeah. And some, some names are being you know, um, put it into the, you know, margin events, mostly uh, from the Greek mythology, uh, because Gaia is observed by Gaia. And then, well, at least there are several uh, events has been identified. Uh, well, we still need to understand the more ancient era. But yeah, at least there, we see that the Milky Way experienced several margin events. So this picture 
uh, shows a you know, rough sketch of the current understanding of the Milky Way voyage. At more than 10 billion years, this is the kind of early formation scale. As I shown in the simulation movie, the Milky Way has experienced a lot of margin of smaller dwarf galaxies. So by margin, by absorbing a lot of dwarf galaxies, the Milky Way has been grown. There are also a lot of gas accretion. So because of such a gas accretion and margin, around 8.5 billion years ago, the Milky Way has been in the kind of most active phase uh, of uh, in, in the in the history uh, life stage. Maybe about before us, maybe about 20s, maybe more most active stage in the life in the life. And they experienced last major matter which is nowadays called Gaia and Kronos sources. And then the Milky Way uh, goes to more stable evolution. Uh, because these dwarf galaxies are already disrupted and these kinds of margin will be reduced. And then, so this is the, the Milky Way began to form this uh, because there's a gas accretion in the rotating halo uh, from the outside. So the gas are cool uh, to the, you know, the, along with the rotation and then form stars in a very thin structure. So around maybe seven billion years ago, a kind of spiral structure would be formed. It's still debatable, but yeah, kind of uh, spiral structures and form, and then Milky Way like galaxies has been formed. So this is a kind of you know current understanding of last last sketch of the history of the Milky Way. So let's look at a little bit about the future of the Milky Way. So. Actually, we live in the place where local group. In the local group, there are two large galaxies, the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxy. And we know that these galaxies are approaching. And after five, about five billion years later, we think that these two galaxies will be merged. So I will show you what happened if these two galaxies are marked in the simulation? This is the simulations of the galaxy margin uh, of two very large galaxies like the Milky Way and Andromeda. And after about five billion years later, these two galaxies are collide with each other. Like this. When the two galaxies are merged, these two galaxies have a lot of gas. So at the contact of the margin, uh, a lot of stars are formed by the compression of the gas. And then a lot of star clusters are formed. Uh, here. And because galaxies are too, so diffuse, so the margin is not so fast. So actually, it's maybe not firstly, these two galaxies will pass by and then gradually close together again by forming a lot of stars. And as you see, the beautiful st spiral structure has been erased by the margin of two galaxies. And now these two galaxies are transitioned to the elliptical galaxy. So after the merging of the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxy, the elliptical galaxy, we think, will be formed. So if we did in this in this era, maybe we can see a lot of stars in throughout the sky. Yes. However, we cannot see such a you know Milky Way-like structures. So maybe yeah. So. Which, which one would be fun? Maybe, yeah, maybe we are lucky. We can see a beautiful Milky Way now. <laughs> so now, for the Milky Way, uh, has been disrupted and very large galaxies have been well, So, this is the kind of history of the Milky Way from the ancient era uh, to the future. 
So let's look at how assumers will be in the future by using future telescopes and simulations. Now, the US planned to two very extremely large telescopes with a diameter of about 30 meters. One is GMT, and the other one is GMT. Uh, Japan is joining GMT. By using very large telescopes, well, nowadays, the, you know, the largest telescope is about 10 meter diameter. So these two telescopes will be a breakthrough in understanding of the universe. So they can observe very distant galaxy very precisely. And also we can get the precise element abundance of each star in a neutral way. Mm. Uh, this will happen in, in, in the decade. And also the supercomputers is also growing. This is the frontier uh, supercomputer, which is number one in the, uh, in, in, uh, in the world, in the US. And this is Kugaku, the number two, uh, previous number one in the world. So these, by using these supercomputers, we can compute more precise and more high resolution simulations of the galaxy formation. In the current galaxy formation, I didn't tell you that each star is not actually a star. Well, it's a kind of, you know, uh, star clusters. Well, because the supercomputer is too difficult to compute the individual stars. It takes more than a few years to compute individual stars, but by using such large systems, we will be able to compute the you know, get galaxy formation simulations, which can resolve the scale of individual star formation. Mm -hmm. So now we are working on to compute such very large simulations. This movie is a kind of first step to compute the such simulations. This is not the Milky Way. This is actually uh, in, the, in the star cluster formation from the molecular cloud. So it's a very local simulation. So we have developed a very accurate integration of the gravity and then compute individual star formation inside the molecular clouds. As you see, this is a kind of you know, molecular cloud like Orion Nebula, and then, you know, these clouds are you know, gradually attract and then form the stars inside. And the stars are formed. Uh, these stars are, you know, heat the gas, surrounding gas, and then make the structures like this. So maybe you, you observe a lot of nebula, and then you know, the structures of nebula can be, you know, uh, formed by the heating, uh, heating of the stars. And some stars are escaped from the star clusters by the gravitational interaction, which is called the runaway stars. And as time passed, there's no gas supply from the outside in this space, the star clusters. So all of the gas has been removed from the star clusters, and then, you know, kind of naked star clusters are formed. This kind of simulations only can only be done in the you know, scale of star clusters, but in the future, we can get such information from the scale of the galaxy formation. And lastly, I'm going to emphasize the importance of amateur astronomy. This paper uh, posted in the uh, American Astronomical Society, uh, produced from the amateur astronomers. Uh, this is the observations of the you know, gas clouds uh, nearby the Andromeda galaxy. And as you can see, this structure they observed was very large, well, maybe comparable to Andromeda. And actually, actually, this is not recognized previously. But by using the amateur astronomers' telescopes, they uh, find such a structures, and they are doing just kind of remnants of the well, dwarf galaxy, or maybe it's kind of uh, it's just a uh, cloud inside the Milky Way. But in any case, this is very important to uh, observe such a things uh, um, using the amateur astronomers uh, efforts. Well, surprisingly, uh, as you see, the, the doubles is 21,000 total doubles uh, uh, published in this year. Uh, uh, so it's very surprising. And now astronomers arguing what the structure is. So it's, well, it's too diffuse to see the, you know, the very large telescopes like, you know, uh, TNT and Star well, Wars, telescope and Star telescope. But yeah, thanks to the you know, efforts of astron how much astronomers, we can identify the structures. So, so this effort is so important. So lastly, I'm going to show you again the simulation 
history of the Milky Way by using the small scale simulations of the Milky Way. So as I shown that in the earliest era, the Milky Way has experienced a lot of margin of the small galaxies like this. And then grow uh, uh, grow up in the Milky Way. And actually in the simulation, we compute like, the gravity and the uh, models of star formations and the supernova and the you know, compute the cycle of materials inside. And as we see that such a, you know, the galaxy, you know, the fossil records of galaxy margin uh, can be seen by the, you know, kinematics of stars uh, by using astronomical satellite and comparing to the observed data and the simulated data. And we can guess and we can understand how much mass are uh, accreted to the Milky Way or you know, when the margin has been fired. So as we see, a lot of stars are explored and then gas are expelled from the gas. And at the later stage, you know, cold gas accretion to the Milky Way form the spiral structures. So this is a, you know, the history of the Milky Way for 10 billion years. So tonight, I talk about the history of the Milky Way. And uh, simulate by using simulations and observations, we can extract the fossil records of the star preserve stars and then understand the, how the Milky Way was formed. And the current understanding is that the Milky Way was formed from the um, modules of the numerous um, dwarf galaxies. And now, uh, to try to understand the when and how much, how many galaxies has been created to the Milky Way. Maybe in the future, in a decade, we can get some kind of answers and we will get more clearer pictures of the Milky Way planets. And the movies I use, well, you can download and view from the these websites. So thank you very much for your listening. I'm very pleasure to talk here. And yeah, happy to do a Q&A. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, if you have any questions, uh, wait for the microphone. Anybody have any questions here? Dan? Um, as I was watching the simulation, uh, I noticed that there were sort of tubes of material that uh, I think refer to as NOS. Is there uh, any? Um, how, how do you explain how the, the tubes of material or not form? I guess that's that's more of a universe question than a galaxy question, but uh, I was just wondering if uh, you could uh, talk about that. So maybe two of the material, you mean the two of the material may be kind of materials from accreting uh, from the streams? Yes. Yes. So yeah, this kind of structures actually come from the very earliest universe. Um, because you know, in the earliest universe, there is a like quantum fluctuations, and these fluctuations are expanded by the inflations. And the earliest era of the universe, there was a density fluctuation, a small density fluctuation. But small, such small, small density fluctuations are gradually well developed as time passed. And then at the dense region, the materials are you know, invested. So the structure you see is actually the kind of evolves you know, structure from the you know, artist era of the universe. So that would be naturally predicted from the way things would progress from after the Big Bang material, then the cool thing on the starts for us and better. Yes, actually, based on the uh, understanding of cosmology. And we can actually observe the, you know, the, our farthest uh, era of the universe by using the microwave background, which is called microwave background radiation. And we can get, you know, some precise picture of the, well, the fluctuation of the universe by using that. So we can information to the simulation. <laughs> 
start moving away. So the, um, the simulations show the Milky Way in the past, at least in from a starting condition, assumed starting condition. Um, <clears throat> And as as it evolves in the simulations, can we can see many, many, many galaxies actually observe them back through time? Do we see, do we observe analogs to all of the stages that we see in the simulations? Yeah, this is actually, you know, very important question that, you know, yeah, actually we can do such kind of thing. This is called mock observations. So we observe. Uh, the simulations uh, by actually from, from night like, say, telescope. So we assumed you know, some kind of errors imposed by the, some the telescopes in, in, inside the computers and then you know, compare to the observations. So if we look at the you know, earliest uh, error of the simulations and then we can get this kind of uh, objects like the distant galaxies. So this is actually shown in the picture by a gig in the quiz. So yeah, this is a kind of you know, not the pictures directly from the simulation, but uh, actually you get a filter to get uh, similar to represent the observations. So mm -hmm. it's a kind of mock observations. We actually do to do such a things you know, by using the mock observation to do. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a question about the, it looks like when you were describing the Andromeda galaxy merging with our galaxy, it ended up being becoming an elliptical galaxy. Mm -hmm. So we see these elliptical galaxies, aren't they, are they, uh, are those also formed that way? And because I thought, I kind of thought those were earlier galaxies, but maybe not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, you know, astronomers nowadays, uh, well, you know, historically, in astronomers call that elliptical galaxies are early type galaxies, but actually, it's actually formed later. So, for example, M87, very big galaxy, is a kind of elliptical galaxy. This is actually at the center of the galaxy cluster. So this galaxy is actually formed by a lot of galaxy margin, and then we look like elliptical galaxy. So elliptical galaxy is actually formed in later stages of galaxy formation. Yeah, so it's, well, acronym is wrong, actually. As soon as you are type galaxy as an elliptical galaxy, but actually from the state understanding of our uh, galaxy evolution, the Early type galaxy, the elliptical galaxy is a form of lake. Yeah, a little bit confusing, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yes. Anybody else here have any questions for me? Take it to Zoom. Uh, so everyone on Zoom should be able to unmute themselves. So if we have any questions for anyone at home, we can uh, take a few Zoom questions as well. I have a question. Right. Could you tell me about your own research? Oh, sure. Tell me about your any any part of it. You know, your your bachelor's, your master's, your PhD, anything you're doing, anything at all. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. You'll have to reshare your screen as well. <laughs> I turned it off. Two times, much time. So, yeah. Actually, we are doing uh, the small scale simulations of the Milky Way and uh, looking at the individual elements of the stars. So, actually, I am an expert of doing uh, the, you know, looking at the elements. So, as I said, uh, we model um, the, you know, uh, the cycle of materials in the galaxies. They actually, put into some uh, the fo uh, formation of the heavy elements like gold and platinum and europium, and we compare with observations. And we recently find that the, the such, you know, there are several stars that enhanced in the gold, and these stars actually form in the, tend to be formed in the dwarf galaxy by using simulations. So actually I do a simulations and the modeling of the elements heavier than the iron. All right. Anybody else from Zoom? Oh, 
All right, hearing none, we're gonna gonna go ahead and uh, call it. So uh, thank you very much. That was fantastic. We want to appreciate you coming all the way from Japan to give a presentation to us. Although, of course, you made a couple year pit stop at Notre Dame, but it's it's, it's pretty good. All right, so let's go ahead and do we have snacks? Okay, so let's go ahead and take our snack break and we'll come back in here 10, 15 minutes and uh, do our kind of open forum discussion. So please, uh, please stick around. All right, welcome back everyone. For those of you that uh, stuck around, let me mute my audio on the laptop here, I forgot about that. Um, so uh, let's start off as usual with observing reports. We have had, it, it's only been like what, two weeks since we were last here, but uh, did anybody get out and do a little bit of observing? Casual, just going out and saying, oh, there it is. No. Well, that's something. <laughs> <laughs> I went out trying going out and see the alignment of the plants, but never could see um, down low. Trying to see Jupiter, Mars, and or Venus and Mars, that was easy to find. Remember, and watch the moon progress from below one to the above the other, the bell, top the other. I think this was after, it seems like Easter was before the last meeting, but I I haven't taken my solar scope out very much because, like I said, throughout much of April, I've been either, either working on the newsletter or writing a rant. So that, that takes a lot of time to make it. Because you know, it's hard to convince people to give you money and you want to make it sound good. <laughs> uh, but I set up my solar scope for the first time. Uh, I think it was actually Easter Sunday, and you know I, I watched it uh, through much of the afternoon, and I did catch a M-class solar flare. Uh, I, I forget the exact name of the sunspot group. I can look it up, but it's not that important. But there was a you know a brightening near the sunspot group. It wasn't really with the sunspot group, but near it, and then it just dimmed back down. So. That's a solar flare. That's what they look like in HL. You mean you were observing? Observing. Because you, you just you're you're looking at it and it's like wow. it's bright. And you come back maybe a few minutes later, it looks a little brighter. Then it gets really bright and suddenly it dims back down again. That's what a solar flare looks like. Wow. Uh, probably five six minutes. Oh, they're very quick. No, it, it was it was just an M class. If it was because I did look it up later, it, it, it was definitely an M class. If it was an X class and had a really powerful, you know, explosion, maybe you could see like a ripple. I've never seen that before. But like I mentioned uh, years ago at, at a crane fest, I set up my solar scopes and saw this massive prominence fly away as part of a coronal mass ejection. Yeah. And I was just flipping out. Yeah. I just kept t telling people, come look, come look, come look. I've never seen anything like that. They thought I was crazy. For, for the prominence, that was over the course of a, a couple of hours. It was slow. Okay, so, so it's not like yeah, come over here quick. No, you know, it was a huge prop. Took up like you know one quarter of you know, the area around the sun, and it just gradually flew outward. It was really really. So I spent I spent the afternoon watching that at Grand Fest. Yes, um, I, I was this is not maybe maybe not a regular observing report, but you were talking about the street lights. Yeah, we had one of those uh, horrible. Uh, LEDs put in our. We have a street light right on the corner of our property. And um, October 2021, they came out. I saw them do it because I was working at home at the time. And so I truck pulled up. I said, What are you doing? Oh, we're replacing these. Said, don't mess up my, you know, don't look at the in on our driveway or in the house or anything. And he put some tape around it. But anyway, I, I, uh, Okay. <laughs> it's around the farther. Anyway, I worked with them. I fought with thought work, whatever, with Portage and and the uh and consumers uh, power. What they call consumers energy? I don't know. But anyway, um, they finally put a sheet. It's not perfect. It's it's it's, it's it helps. It helps. So it's, it's kind of shining out more out toward the street as opposed to where the driveway is. Um, it, so you can get something that would help. 
but you have to kind of yeah, they, they they say, oh, this is Porridge is like we don't we can't do that. It's their life and Porridge say, oh, it's the consumer's life, we can't do it. Yeah. yeah. So you gotta get the heads together and kind of fit them together. Yeah. Say, Look, I'm just if you don't if you want to claim this, I'll claim the light and I'll 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 put my own lampshade over it. And you know, but um they finally they finally did it. I saw the guy do it. Um, well, if it's hooked up to the internet, like a lot of the street lights are now, you can just ask for the IP number and turn it off if you want. <laughs> the light switch on. Yeah, off you go. Yes. I heard you uh, talking earlier about the color that you're putting out on these lights, the 5K and 6K. Yes. One of the things, I, I deal with electric stuff and I sell that kind of stuff. Uh, I've seen articles where a lot of stuff on um, the 5K and 6K. LED lighting affects the animals mm -hmm. in the oh, yeah. area. No. It completely disrupts their sleep cycle. It can just like you said, oh, 3K is about yeah, yeah, it's a, it's yeah. it's considered a carcinogen too. The the American Medical Association considers light pollution a carcinogen. They they found people that work at night with lights don't get the melatonin. That we do while we're sleeping at night, and, and they get they they get breast cancer or uh, some some other form of cancer. Oh. Richard, uh, yes. A couple months ago, uh, the marijuana guys on the Mazel, we buy five thousand acres. Mm -hmm. They, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> right after I passed this, yes, <laughs> uh, they they were applying they were applying to change their their whatever from just medical to recreational. And they had gotten bought out by some larger statewide chain. And they put up three big, huge lights pointing out of the street. And when they were asking for a zoning permission, I forwarded some information to Mark, and he forwarded it to the zoning board, saying that these lights were in violation of the township ordinance. Perhaps they should be changed to that before they're allowed to get the marijuana uh, change. Those lights are missing on the building. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, there's one way to spend any time somebody has a zoning board, planning board, pay attention. Uh, so, there actually can't see yeah. You can make an impact. I used to be on my township planning commission for about a decade. And we instituted a rule that lights had to be cut off style in less than 60,000 degrees and some other things uh, for any commercial buildings. So, they'll listen if you talk to them. They're not just going to keep talking at them. Just... I can't really say whether there's a connection there or not. I assume so. I haven't talked with the commissioners to tell whether that's true. But yeah, I, I sent Mark's photo of people over at mine. And uh, sometime after that, the lights just appear off the side of the building. So here we go. I will say it worked. <laughs> yeah. We can claim it. But claim it. There. Now you can see me. Uh... There too. You got you got me double light. I, I guess I didn't plug it in all the way because there's some stuff I wanted to share. Okay, well, looks like we don't I have too many observing sorts. reports, which isn't too surprising because hell, we we were just here like two weeks ago. I have an observing we met report. on the 14th, which is the latest we can meet. You know, when we delay one week. Um, I have an observing. Um, I do have some astronomical news that I wanted to share. Uh, I'm sure maybe others have some, but I, I had several things that I that I jotted down. Uh, first, um, uh, perhaps you saw it recently. Let me uh, bring the screen up here. Mike, you want to darken the lights a bit? And uh, whoop, that that's the. Um, I, I don't want to ruin the surprise for later. <laughs> and uh, so I should be able to share my laptop and have it pop up on there. So for the, uh, the this is the uh, first image of a black hole shadow and jet together. And uh, of course, this was mentioned earlier. This is the heart of M87. And uh, you can see the shadow in the uh, inset picture here, that little black area between the two bright points is the shadow. And you can see the, you know, the, the famous jet escaping M87 from the uh, supermassive black hole. So this is the first time we've seen the actual shadow of the event horizon and the jet at the same time. And this was a collaboration. It wasn't with the uh, um, the Event Horizon Telescope, but many of the telescopes are uh, uh, from that. Uh, this is composed of the Global Millimeter VLDI, you know, the very long baseline interferometry array. 
Uh, ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, and the Greenland Telescope are used uh, to create this image. This is at a uh, uh, three and a half millimeters, um, you know, wavelength. While the the EHT, you know, the uh, EHT, the uh, Event Horizon Telescope, yeah, the EHT, uh, that's at one and a half millimeters to cut through the jet stuff to see right to the central region where the black hole is supposed to be. But here we have both together. Unfortunately, it's not animated. And then, of course, uh, I don't know if you saw, I actually did get on YouTube. So this is kind of an observing report, too. But um, I just happened to, you know, because I was, it, it was late at night, and I figured I'll, I, I saw a link, you know, uh, you know a, a suggested video on YouTube for the live uh, eclipse from Australia. And just as I clicked on, it was just about at totality. I'm like, oh, perfect. So. Man, I couldn't have timed that better. So I got the watch totality of the April 20th hybrid eclipse. But of course, where the video was, it was a total, not uh, an annular. And I did want to share uh, one more thing here. Well, in this case, the moon is just close enough to the Earth, or you could say even far away, to, to just cover up the moon. You know, maybe then some. That's why totality was only one minute. So... Um, th there's like a, a spot in the middle that's total, and then on either end, it, it, it's annular. So you have to be in just the right area along a short, e an even shorter path to see a total. And uh, oop. so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here is an image of the April 20th hybrid eclipse. And this is actually, believe it or not, from one of our members. Technically, he's an honorary member, but this is from none other than Fred Espinak. Because Fred Espinak went all the way to Australia for one minute of totality. So I hear people whining. I'm not going down to Texas because it's too far. It's four and a half minutes in Texas. Well, Fred went to freaking Australia for a minute. A minute. He is. But so I don't I just don't see what the big deal of going down to freaking Texas. We only have, you know, after this one, the next one's 20 years away. This is our last chance to do something like this together. Okay, let me do another share here because uh, there's an image from the, and maybe our, our speaker can correct me in this. It's from the Hakutu R program, you know, the, the Japanese lunar lander. And that snapped a really, really cool picture. <laughs> let me see. Uh, I got to do a new share because I came prepared here. Well, we'll just do that one. And here it comes. So let me uh, go to the old magnifying glass there, and we'll zoom in there a bit. If I, if I click it right, we'll just have it fill the screen. Go away. Go away. There we go. So this is an image from that uh, lunar lander that unfortunately uh, failed to land on the moon on uh, April 25th. But, of course, this is an image from the lander an orbit around the moon on April 20th. And of course you can see the moon. I don't know why the cursor is still there. That must be from the laptop. That's really annoying. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's not called a landing though. And of course you can see the earth, but can you see the shadow from the eclipse right there? So you can, you can zoom in. And there it is. That's a high definition. That's that's uh, that's 700% zoom too, and that's still pretty good. Uh, print that I'll send us all copies. Print, print is dead. All right, and of course, uh, now for the bad news. There was a severe geomagnetic storm on April 23rd that triggered aurora. And uh, it was uh, Aurora was visible as far south as 
Terlingua, Texas. I have no idea. But uh, they're at a latitude of 29 and a half degrees. So you know what that means? Wow. We definitely missed Aurora. We were screwed again, royally screwed. I kept peeking outside over and over again for at least maybe a crack in the clouds where you can see some shimmering. And uh, nothing, nothing. And the last thing that I have noted down here is uh, for the first time ever, a uh, star has been caught swallowing a planet because it's long been taught in astronomy classes that as the Earth expands into a red giant, it's definitely going to gobble up Mercury. It's definitely going to gobble up Venus and then maybe Earth. But there's some that say as the star expands, there'll be gravitational changes and Earth might move out a bit and or it might survive. But uh, here's a case of where uh, the planet was uh, eaten up. This was dis discovered by uh, Kishle D. I'm sure I'm butchering that too. Uh, he's from MIT. And he uh, used a survey, uh, he used survey data from the Zwicky Transit Facility at Palomar Observatory. And he captured a sun-like star in its golden years, you know, toward the end of its life. And it's 12,000 light years away in Aquila. And they have this little um, uh, video on YouTube that I can't show you because the damn zoom controls keep getting in the way. There we go. <clears throat> So let me see if I can share this. I've never, nope, that doesn't work. Oh, there we go, okay. It's just a little delayed. So we, I don't know if we'll have any sound on this, but who cares? I don't have the sound hooked up to this system. So there it is, you can hear it going, nom, 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 nom. I'll, I'll, I'll add some special sound effects there. Of course, it, uh, I think this is like a Jupiter-sized planet, but I'm sure it made the star a little gassier than it already was. Uh, it's a little laggy because because I'm sharing the screen and it's going there. So. But I'll, uh, I'll link to that in the, in the, in the write-up um, in the newsletter as well, so you can watch a non-laggy version. All right, there we go. So, uh, any other astronomical news anybody wanted to share? Jack? SpaceX launched their new moon. Well, we can bring the lights back up too, uh, Mike. The big super uh, rocket a few weeks ago. Well, no. It didn't yeah, blow. It, it, it didn't blow. It was unexpected, un unscheduled rapid disassembly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there we go. They blew up. There we go. But they were all the way on that one. It blew up. All right. You cleared the tower. It yeah. got up to staging. It yeah. was so successful. We were wonderful. Yeah. But after staging, it didn't go so well. Now, yeah. remember. Rapid disassembly. <laughs> Elon, Elon Musk is all into. Uh, you know, anti woke and yada yada yada. That that that's a woke term for it, it blowing up. So hypocrite much? There we go. Hang on there, Greg. No sharing yet. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Look at there. Assembly of the of the that's the first time you launch a, a super rocket that's the first one. Oh, you don't want that. No, no. You're not going to do it with that. All right. Any other astronomical news? Keep things moving here. All right. Nothing. 
All right, let's uh, give a quick preview of the event horizon. Uh, the next board meeting is on Sunday, May 7th at 5 o'clock p.m. We're going to meet at Sunnyside Church. Uh, from what I understand, all the board members are going to be there. And uh, if you want to uh, come, if you're you know a new member or interested in getting involved in the club and see uh, what goes on behind the scenes, uh, we'll be there. So feel, feel, feel free to join us at Sunnyside uh, this Sunday at 5 o'clock. And then we have public observing sessions at the Kalamazoo Nature Center on uh, May 13th and May 27th. We're kind of uh, one and one right now. I don't know if you can consider the first session a success. I mean, yeah, more than, I think we even had more than that. It was a good turnout. We had several people bring telescopes. So thanks to like Joe and Don for bringing scopes. But yeah, it was, it was yeah. The sky was starting to open up a little bit, so I could show them a couple things in the parking lot. And on the left, the sky was getting better. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it by the time we, uh, by the time the last of us left, it was getting a little better, but there was still like a haze over the sky. So it was never clear, clear. Yeah. Well, it's easy to open up, but. No, that uh, we, I, I think, uh, I think. What what name is rain too? I think we did get rain and everything. It was, it was pretty obvious that that one was going to happen. The one on the thirteenth uh, this month, uh, you know, the, the the forecast going out to to the thirteenth doesn't look terribly good. But you know, who who knows? It, it could change. So, so as usual, keep an eye on the website. And then uh, prime focus. Uh, the deadline, of course, is the fifteenth of every month. And uh, I want to thank uh, Gregory Shanos for uh, writing the article on Venus. Greg, did you want to share something about that? You should be able to unmute yourself and uh, tell us about your article that you had on the screen there for a second. There we go. There it is. That's it. I don't know. Uh... That's, I think I have it set so everyone can unmute themselves. Yeah, allow participants to unmute themselves. So it's not on my end. Let's do that. Can you unmute yourself there, uh, Gregory? Okay, can you hear me now? There you go. Now we can hear All right. you. All right, great. Uh, my name is Greg Shanus. I live down in uh, Sarasota, Florida. And I became acquainted with the club during the great lockdown. I took Richard President Bell's um, uh, astronomy course and received my certificate. And then I was uh, every month listening to the uh, Zoom lectures, and I was really impressed with this club. This club has a PhD level speaker, astronomer, every month practically. I mean, I've never, so this is a club I want to belong to. I mean, you guys are amazing. You even had a um, Nobel Prize winner to boot, I remember. Yeah. So uh, I, I like planetary imaging and submit my images to ALPO, the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. And I've really gotten into imaging Venus. And Venus, as you know, uh, so I wrote this article here, and uh, this is Richard Bell's contribution. He added this and this, that, that's really good. I, I wish I didn't I take the it. picture though. I just ripped it off from a website. Yeah, I know uh, the <laughs> website, but you can buy this really inexpensive for like $75 and it includes a UV filter an IR filter and a methane filter. And um, when you look at Venus, it, you know, nobody cares to look at Venus because it's bland, it's just white, vanilla white, it doesn't show any features. And the only thing that's interesting is its phase, you know, you start to see a crescent, it looks really cool, but uh, nothing can be further from the truth because if you look at it in the ultraviolet and infrared, you see clouds and the clouds appear dark. Um, 
And right here, here's three of my images. This is through a uh, color um, ZWO camera. And then this is with a UV filter and this is with an infrared. And the ultraviolet filter gives you the high altitude clouds and the infrared filter gives you uh, mid altitude clouds. So it's really uh, very easy to do. And I know there's a lot of great um, deep sky images here and i hope this inspires you to get into planetary because planetary is just so much easier <laughs> you know you just take a 60 second video line it stack and sharpen and you're essentially done it's not doesn't take uh hours of uh of uh obtaining the exposure so this is my and this is my setup here you can see the palm trees in the back. But that's it. I basically just wanted to introduce myself. And um, and uh, if you haven't already, uh, please read my article. And hopefully it inspires you to start imaging Venus and the other planets too. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Greg. Okay, I'll stop sharing. All right. Okay, um, so um, prime focus. Oh yeah, um, there was a couple of things I wanted to mention. I, I just um, so we do have a. Uh, I'll give you a quick preview for June. Apparently, uh, Dave Garden wrote an article on the uh, the actual Ashby telescope, not the one on the observatory, but the one that he and his wife built that he restored. So we'll have that in the next newsletter. And uh, so again, just keep the contributions coming. The newsletter, I think, has been really good this year because people are sharing articles at least once a month, and that's what makes the newsletter more interesting. And um, one thing I was thinking about, um, you know, because last year I did like this what, three, three or four part series on Robert Burnham and his 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 kind of life, and you know, but um, I, I I thought about and this kind of came up even during the presentation tonight is uh. You know, maybe I could break apart uh, Galileo's Starry Messenger and put that in the newsletter for people that never read it before. So yeah. I don't know if anybody would be interested in seeing that, but that'd probably take at least at least half a dozen parts. It's not it's not a huge book, but it's 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 long. Yeah, so so I so I could break it up into chunks. Because I, I don't know if you guys remember years ago for Astronomy Day in two thousand nine. You know, we did the four hundred years of astronomy with Galileo and. And I, I I created the booklet of Starry Messenger that, that we passed out to people. And I still have that. It's actually right right on here somewhere. Uh, but I'm not going to find it now. It'd take forever. Uh, yeah. Yep. And and Phil played. And Phil played. Uh, any, any other items of business anybody wanted to mention? Mike. All right. So one of the things that I think is can't be done. We have a series of research activities for our, our students. Freshmen do literature review, sophomores do team, uh, chemistry research, and physics we do uh, lots of different kinds of research, uh, primarily through my, my program. And one of the things we've been doing over the last seven or eight years is high altitude balloon research. Uh, this year we had five launches and three high altitude balloons, two low altitude stereo, uh, stereo imaging. Um, shots, we put pairs of uh, GoPro cameras next to each other, launched the balloon until it was about two or three kilometers up, very short 15, 20 minute flight, took stereoscopic images, and then now we can do stereoscopes. Um, high altitude balloon stuff, we're working primarily on, on uh, uh, UV information, uh, gamma radiation, all that kind of stuff at altitude, but uh, with the input of a couple of students, I think next year is like the perfect storm because I want to do three high altitude balloon launches with uh, little GoPros with with small telescopes attached to them because I want to take pictures of the eclipse at 80,000 feet or higher. Our highest altitude launch has been 116,000. Our lowest been about 78,000. That's well above cloud, which means we can be anywhere around here where it's cloudy and it will not be cloudy up there. So I need some ideas for how do I raise about $5,000 because the cost of helium is crazy expensive and I want to buy some, you know, high level GoPros. We have strato trackers, which allow us to track the, 
balloons at high altitude. We also have Spot Trace, which is a GPS device, does almost the same thing. It actually tells you the ground location as opposed to a strata tracker, which is a radio communicated system. And, and it, we lose it about two, 300 meters off the ground. So we have to track it by a GPS locator. Um, but it, we use a small, uh, you know, styrofoam containers. We have six, 800, 1200 uh, gram balloons, fill those bad boys with helium and let them fly. And the students do all the research. So I, my goal is three high altitude balloon launches during the eclipse so we can take pictures at altitude. So if you have any idea how to help me raise some money, let me know because I need money. Don't yeah. take dollar throw. Hey. You got a hundred dollars, got a hundred dollars, we got two hundred dollars, we got two hundred dollars. Five thousand people are going through about fifty is what it's going through right now because they just had a test of physics and they were not happy. But that's how they're going to work. There are a lot of fancy alumni, Mike. That so uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a certain cool. Start pitching that out there. Well, you know, and any grant organization, I'll always Facebook. appreciate. Yeah, I guess your students probably got Facebook. Uh, presences, oh, yeah. or, or yeah. media presences. You know, it's, it's the, the key elements. The stuff we really need is really helium. Yeah, I, mean, I have access to almost everything else, but helium is expensive. Yeah, pricey, right. no. We spent twelve hundred dollars on helium this year for, for five launches, and that's substantially more than it was even five years ago. I mean, you could launch two so for hundred bucks, but not now you've been able to, you've been able to recover all of those high. We've never balloons. lost a balloon. Is that right? We've never lost a balloon. Yeah. So, and I'm particularly concerned right now because there's Senate Bill 294, <laughs> which basically is going to fine organizations that they launch balloons with the exception of the National Weather Service. They're the only governmental agency we authorize to launch them. So I have been contacting every legislator saying, for the love of God, do not pass this legislation. I've personally contacted the office of the person who wrote the original bill and Sean McCann, who chairs that committee, they don't even get back to me. So I have no idea how to contact these people, but I guarantee you that if this gets out of committee, I'm writing letters to every single legislator, the governor, I'm going to crash into the <laughs> Capitol building to stop this because it's idiotic legislation. Was the Michigan what? bill not a yes? Well, Michigan bill to stop balloons from being, you know, just oh, so fill up helium will go. I mean, the, the idea is well, it's you know, polluting Great Lakes with rubber. Okay. I understand, yeah, that. I recognize the issue, wow. but if you drive down I 94, there are a hell lot more plastic grocery bags polluting <laughs> this, this state than any balloons up But your here. record is you've recovered all your balloons. That's true. We have so, recovered all our balloons. You haven't lost any. Nope, but they're going to find you just for launching it. That's the issue. Hey, my hydrogen is cheaper. You could name your balloon <laughs> yeah. the Hindenburg. Yeah. Yes. Oh, my God. Yeah. And then you blow up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, my humanity. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to jail for this. I'm <laughs> launching three balloons next year regardless. Is <laughs> this diameter right now? Uh, usually they're about six to eight feet across when we release, oh, yeah. but they get up to about 40 feet. And then, and we've actually had a couple of um, imagings where a lot of kids will take the GoPros and they'll set it for one shot for, for like every minute or two. And I've got a couple of shots where you can actually see the balloon shatter. It, it, it shears, it just breaks off. Uh -huh. It's look like tendrils, but you can see the gas envelope yeah. from the helium inside. So you see the gas and then you see the balloon itself. And then of course you got a hair heap above it. And so that whole thing starts to come down. And when you track it, this you can tell it at first because it's going up, it's going up, it's going, and all of a sudden it's falling ass on the way down. <laughs> and, and then when it hits the atmosphere about 15, 20,000 feet up, the parachute deploys because yeah. it's already going to open, but it needs enough air to fill it. Right. Then it fills it and then start tracking off. And if there's any high winds, they're going to chase. Plus, we were kind of losing one as we, we had a balloon land about 10 miles west of Fort Hero. So that's a close week. We've been in northwestern Ohio a couple of times. North Central Indiana, Northeastern Indiana. Most of our balloons land in Michigan, though, somewhere between Jackson and Detroit. You want a couple hundred miles, then. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. You have to uh, uh, notify 
So yeah, we, have, we file a no tan with each launch, which is a notice of uh, aerial emission. Uh, we have to notify. We notify. We used to notify through Calumet Zoo, but now I notify through Chicago, which is Chicago the hub. Um, and then they process that to Detroit, so they can track it. You also have to put a reflector on the thing. So yeah, I'm seeing the, the have the reflector basketball. So they can, yeah, they can see this as it's flying. Um, so what's what's the beef? I don't really because that. they don't want these things to be launched. <laughs> and the other thing is, we, we bought a, a camera, a streaming video camera, that with Wi Fi, you can actually watch what you see. And, and several years ago, one of our launches, the, the team picked up an airline flight flying below the balloon. <laughs> they tracked it. It was a Philadelphia to Minneapolis St. Paul flight. And they track it on the balloon imaging with this little screaming camera. I want that aimed at, a, at an eclipse. That's what I want to aim yeah. So that's our goal is to try to get that in place. And to avoid going to jail, just make sure you print on it property of Senator Ted Cruz. <laughs> there you go. I'm sure I go fight that. <laughs> All right. Jail. Let's see. Oh, dear. All right. Now I lost the podium there. Here we go. There's the podium. Okay. Sorry, people at home for getting sick. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, there is uh, one other item that I want to do. I forgot to do this earlier, and I'm glad our speaker is still here, as I wanted to present our guest speaker with a Kalamazoo Astronomical Society lapel pin. So come up and receive your pen. We try to remember to give one of these to every speaker. So again, thank you for the excellent thank you. presentation. There you go. Thank you. Alrighty. Oh, darn. I lost my, uh, lost my screen here. Uh, next month, uh, we have another PhD. So they, they keep coming. Uh, next month for the June meeting, uh, we're going to have the search for ancient microbial life on Mars. It'll be basically about the Perseverance rover and the sample return mission that uh, it's currently undergoing. And, you know, it's collected several samples and just kind of left them uh, behind. And uh, so that'll be given by Dr. Michael Velbel from Michigan State University. This will be his second time joining us. First time was 10 plus years ago or something like that. And uh, so uh, that'll be our last meeting uh, here next month until October, because we're actually going to have the September meeting at the Nature Center. And um, I want to uh, thank uh, Jeremiah Poole for bringing snacks. You notice he's not here, but he, he dropped off snacks and had to go to his daughter's birthday party. Uh, so that's understandable, but uh, do we have any volunteers to bring snacks for the June meeting? Scott, you want to bring snacks? Fantastic. Okay, great. All right, so if there's nothing else, uh, we will officially adjourn at 9, oh, damn, it just changed, 9.14 p.m. So thanks for coming. We'll see you next time.